journalism, and I was a professional before I was uh, offered the job that I have now. I have an endowed chair, um, and I don't have a PhD because of the kind of field I'm in. Sometimes that kind of thing happens. So uh, I, I was awarded a, a Fulbright for the 2004-2005 school year, roughly. The um, <coughs> another thing you might consider is the uh, the semesters don't always match up. So I left in November, and that year, there, the semester began, I think, in early December. So I left, I think, the week before Thanksgiving, and I was there about two weeks before the semester started. I'll just show you a couple photos. Like, I know you don't want to see somebody else's like, you know, photos. But just to give you a certain idea, because a lot of people, including most of my colleagues, didn't really have a clear idea of where Malaysia was. And I remember, like, the week before I left, somebody said, oh, yeah, everybody's Buddhist there, right? No, it's an Islamic country, you know. No, er, you know, not, not get the Jeopardy question. Um, so that's where it is, so you can see in the inset. And um, just to give you an idea, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's still considered a developing country, but it's, it's I, I like to think of it as nearly developed. Um, but there's a lot of diversity, too. So there's rural areas that I visited. Um, it's mainly 60%. Islamic, 30% Chinese who are Buddhist and Taoist for the most part, but there's a lot of Christian Chinese, and then 10% uh, Indian, mostly Tamil, mostly Hindu. Um, that was where I taught. It was a brand new shiny building. Um, had really nice computer labs. Um, these are three of my colleagues. Uh, the woman on the right was a junior colleague. She had just barely started. The other two are professors and uh, the woman on uh, second from the right had worked um, for the national TV news organization, the you know, state TV, and had actually covered the prime minister for like 10 years before she was a professor. So, you know, the kind of people we meet. This is um, commencement um, from the back of the room, all the mortarboards. Um, this was uh, uh, my, one of my classes, the master's students. They tended to move through the program in a batch. Um, which is true in a lot of countries. So they had started together. They took all the same classes each semester. And so this was the end of their second year and they were going to graduate. Um, we had a faculty picnic one day. So we were at the park, eating a lot of food, singing karaoke. Some of my colleagues, these are the, the, some of the men professors, some of the women professors. Um, and I got to go to a wedding. Um, the guy on the far left is one of my students, and he invited me to his aunt's wedding. That's his aunt getting married. And, uh, and there's a tradition where everybody who goes to the wedding has to get their picture taken with the happy couple. And my student's mom, who was the sister of the bride. And anyway, so that's just my little, so like, quick glance at Malaysia. I could have shown you 100 pictures of food. I mean, great food, right? So this idea of cultural immersion. Um, yes, I did actually work. <laughs> I taught two graduate classes. Um, uh, the graduate classes were given entirely in English. The whole program was given in English for the graduate students. Um, undergrads were taught in a mixture of Bahasa Malay and uh, Bahasa Malayu and um, English, mostly uh, Bahasa. Um, but the graduate students' classes were given 100% in English and all their work was expected to be done in English. Mainly the program wanted somebody to teach. My award was called Teaching Research, right? So I made a proposal that was primarily about research, but it turned out I didn't have that much time for research. On the other hand, having tenure and having a PhD, that didn't matter to me at all. But I would say, if you're getting a teacher teaching research, teaching slash research award, um, you might want to check that out. So I had two graduate classes in the semester when I taught. And so, you know, they, they give written exams as well as write papers. Here, we don't usually give exams to our grad students in my college. We mainly make them write papers. There, they do both. So there was grading, and there were textbook issues, and there was bureaucracy. Um, but I had about 20 students in each of the two classes. Um, I had good resources. Uh, my colleagues were fantastic, you know, various colleagues helped me in various ways, took me to their homes, took me on trips. Um, and the stipends that look so puny, like these tiny little amounts of money, it was plenty, it was fine, it was no problem. Um, and my, my there's, a, there's one of these, what do you call it, a joint commission in Malaysia, the, the American Malaysian Commission. Um, and they had set up certain things. So one thing that was taken care of for me was my housing was supplied 
by the university. Like, it was ready for me before I got there. I had a nice, I had a two-bedroom apartment, even though I'm single. I didn't take a family, but it, they couldn't get a smaller one. So I had two bedrooms um, with a kitchen and a nice bathroom. Um, it was about, oh, about half a mile from the university, so it's easy to go there. Um, and they, the deal was that the university was required to pay for that for me. And every month my stipend showed up in my bank account electronically, like direct deposit, and the apartment was paid for, so the puny little money, it was, it was plenty of money. And, um, and I, didn't get, I didn't get a sabbatical. What happened was I applied for one and I didn't get one, but I got the grant. So that came up, so that's what happened here. So I went to my dean, and I'm like, please give me this back boy anyway, because I got this. And she's like, no. And I said, well, what can I do? I'm not allowed to delay this. And she said, you could take an unpaid leave. And I was like, with this puny little stipend, and I have a mortgage. But I made it work. I, I depleted a bit of my bank account, but it was not, you know, it was not the end of the world. I came back with a lot less money in my bank account than I had when I left. But I was okay. Uh, I did not rent my house because I have a tax. So I had a grad student live in my house for eight months. One of our grad students, a uh, dissertation, a PhD student on whose committee I sat, you know, <laughs> so I knew she was going to take good care of my house. But I did not charge her rent, right? So she took care of the yard, she took care of the cats, she took care of the mail, and if anything came that she thought I should deal with, once a month she sent me an invoice. That was how I dealt with that part. While I was there, another thing, like, so I'm trying to give you information, so if you want to ask me questions, you'll know what I know. While I was there, there were three other Fulbright professors, core, standard, like me. Um, they, let's see, we all, we all four came at the same time. There were also five Fulbrighter students who we interacted, there were various things where we all got together and there was this neat thing at the end where we all got to go on a trip together all over the country that was paid for by some American thing where they brought some journalists and we kind of got a junket. We got to like go all over Malaysia and stay in fancy hotels. Yeah, and, and, and there was extra bonus travel money um, that I found out from the Malaysian American Commission guy um, who ran that. Um, one of the students told me, oh, I, you know, I said, I haven't seen you for a while. You haven't been at things. Where were you? He's like, oh, I was backpacking in Vietnam, Cambodia, the Philippines, and wherever. And I'm like, whoa, how are you doing that? He said, oh, well, you get extra travel money. Don't you guys get extra travel money? The students get extra travel money. So I emailed the guy, and I said, can I get extra travel money? He said, oh, yeah, we have some extra travel money for you. Do you want it? You have to travel in region. And I'm like, yeah, actually, uh, I, I want to go to Borneo for three weeks. He said, yeah, here's some money. <laughs> and so, yeah, so after school went, after, you know, final exams were graded and everything, I got this extra little pot of money. So I was actually only supposed to stay seven months, um, but I got this extra money and I went to Borneo and hung out in the jungle for three weeks and traveled. Actually, the whole length and breadth of Borneo, and when I came back, my colleagues were like, you've been to places now that we've never been to. <laughs> right? So my colleagues are friendly. And then the other thing I'd like to mention about as far as a cultural experience, um, it's really neat to live in a place that's completely different from where you come from. Um, uh, and I had never done that before. I traveled a bit. I had been to Malaysia twice before. Um, for work, only like two weeks each time. So I've sort of seen the country a little. I don't speak Bahasa, although I now have a big vocabulary of Bahasa, but no grammar, unfortunately. Um, but the <laughs> point of things, I guess. Um, but while you're traveling around, while you're living your life, you know, along in the supermarket, all that kind of thing, it is fantastic to to, well, people, and plus, you stick out like a sore thumb if you're another race, which I was, right? So everybody's always asking where you're from. And Malaysia's a country, I recommended it to the woman sitting behind me, because they get lots of British people and lots of Australian people there, but they don't get a lot of Americans. So you're like this exotic foreign animal. And when you say, I'm from the US, people are like, oh, and I was there in 2004 and 2005. So I heard a lot about our president. But nobody was ever like you know mean about me or even the country. But people were awfully mean about our former president. Um, but but like in a, but they wanted to have a discussion, 
And it was really cool. So like some woman in the grocery store would be saying, what's wrong with your president? And I'd say, I don't know, you know? He, he has, he's, anyway, and you'd have this conversation, and in the end, you know, you could tell that we liked each other. And that would happen every day. That would happen like at the McDonald's. Yes, I ate at McDonald's. Um, uh, anyway, and with my students, with my students' parents, with you know, people, like I say, people take you home for dinner all the time. Um, so you get a lot of interaction. Um, I think one of the great things about having a teaching appointment, too, is because you're seeing these students all the time and you're this exotic foreign animal to them, they like to take you home. They like to take you to their auntie's wedding. Um, they like to pick your brain. They like to show you off. They like to introduce you to people. So, and I'm not that social. I might sound really friendly, but I'm not a big social butterfly. But people take you around and do stuff with you. So um, that was part of what made it a great experience. And I'm, I'm finally eligible. You have to wait five years after you've come back from one to apply for your final second one. So I'm applying for my second one this year. I haven't picked my country yet. Um, but I can't wait to go again. Um, so that was my experience. And I'd be happy to ask any kinds. And I know a lot. Um, one of the three other uh, Fulbright professors who was there, there was one man who brought his wife and their two sons, who, who were like this big, and they put them in school and everything because it was a school year. The other two professors were men who brought their wives, but they didn't have kids with them. Um, and I had a bunch of interaction with the students too. So if you have questions about those things, I could possibly answer you know, more than just for myself. And I'd be happy, also, if you wanted to know anything about Malaysia, I'm happy to answer anything about that. Yeah. Yeah, so you're lecturing in English, and yeah. how, how well do the students understand? Oh, that ranged widely yeah. in the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the students were, were insanely fluent, like, like shockingly fluent, and they'd never been out of the country. I had one student, and I think it was because she was addicted to American TV and movies. She was the most fluent Malaysian I met, I think. And she was like, you know, 22. Um, and then there were people who could barely understand. And I had one student who I actually went and talked to my colleagues about, because they give them an English proficiency exam before they admit them to the master's program, because the master's program is all in English. And I'm like, what is up with this student? I mean, you tested her? Are you kidding me? She can't even read the book. And they said, oh, we're not really sure how that happened. And they asked around. They said, who did the interview with her? And I said, well, she speaks all right, but she can't read. She doesn't have enough vocabulary. And so, you know, they kind of, like, acted embarrassed. And, and they did tell me that she would be coming back. Like, she did. She was in her first semester, so she didn't come back for the second semester. So that was the extreme other end. Um, and when people, I mean, they know this. Um, when one of the Malaysians is teaching the master students and the student has difficulty in English, of course they can lapse into Bahasa and explain something, and I couldn't. Um, but they were aware, like that student, they didn't let her stay. So you, you, you're fine. And like other students too, if, if a student's really confused, you could ask like the, the film fanatic, I could ask her to translate. Oh, and sometimes I had them have discussions about the readings in um, groups together, and I said, speak in Bahasa. Go ahead, you know, you speak, and then when your groups are done, then we'll talk in English. And those were always really lively, and in fact, that was really strange to them, and they really liked it a lot, and the first time I did that, one of the guys who was a professional journalist at a newspaper, so it was an older, you know, mature um, working person, um, some of the students are just fresh out of undergrad, and some are mature and older and everything, um, and he looked up and he said, is this how you teach in there? I'm like, well, not always. <laughs> but they really liked that. They thought that was neat to have small group discussions. Sorry, that's a long answer. I'm always concerned. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Did you, did you teach uh, a course that you had already taught in your UF? Um, no, not actually. I, I taught one course I was well qualified to teach because my area is online journalism. So I'm all into you know, technology and Twitter and things like that. So the one course they asked me to teach was communication technologies. Um, and it was sort of like a history social thing that I made it up, but I had never taught that here. And certainly I taught something sort of like that at the undergrad level, but not graduate. And um, the other course they asked me to teach uh, mass communication theory, which we teach in my college, but I had never ever taught. 
Um, and I had it in my master's program, so I dug up a book and managed. Yeah, but I did have a new prep because, and also uh, they, the the associate dean. I feel like he tried to pull a fast one on me right before I got there. He said, oh, we'd like you to teach three courses in our master's program. And I just wrote back and acted dumb. And I said, no, the Fulbright people told me I was only teaching two because I only teach two here. And that was the last I heard about three. So, yeah, I don't know, but that, was, that worked out fine. Any other questions? No? Thank you. No, no, it was this. It was five years ago. It was fine. Okay. Oh, Tell about the time that we were. I have one application story, though. That another thing, because um, uh, a lot of people asked about uh, the competitiveness, right? So I knew I wanted Malaysia because I visited there, and their press system is very interesting to me because they have entirely different laws for online than they have for broadcast and print, and that's what really my interest area. Um, and so I filled out the application, and it's a quite long application, and time and so forth. And we have a big conference in August, and I wasn't quite